Totally. Yeah, it's fine. Cool, man. Yeah, it's great to see you. You're over there in the UK. We were just talking about how we both have mullets now for perhaps the first time in our lives. And uh, it's very exciting, the quarantine mullet. Yeah, I've gotten close to one before, but this has brought it to a new level. The inaccessibility of getting a haircut and the need to get it out of your eyes once in a while, it just gradually becomes maybe what it was meant to be. Yeah, yeah. It does feel good to switch it up. You know, when I was in high school and middle school and a lot of my life, I had the exact same haircut. You know, it was like I had this round kind of circular dome. Okay, I had like no style. Like I didn't know what style was. My mom helped me pick out clothes from Kohl's that were like two sizes too big. So I had these like yeah. Fred Durst looking shirts on and, um, you know, God love Fred Durst and Limp Biscuit, but I, it just yeah. wasn't working for me, you know. I feel like sometimes parents choose the size of your clothing in a way to represent their love. You know, here's this extra large sweater, my honestly relatively small son. <laughs> but I, but I, want, I, I want you to know I love you this much. You know what I mean? Wow, like, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thing. Yeah, that makes so much sense. It's so sweet because... Um, you know, your mo- your mom just, just wants the best for you. And like, it's like, like sh- <laughs> yeah. this shirt will look good and on, on Brett, even though he's going to middle school and like the midst of like the most chaos he's ever going to experience. And like, right. as a mother, you have no idea, but you're just trying and you're swinging for the fences. And you, I feel like you don't realize that till uh, later in your life when you really yeah. appreciate it, you know? And speaking of fit, that's something I didn't, I didn't learn until maybe 10 years ago that it doesn't matter how much you like an article of clothing. If it doesn't fit, don't get it. But I kept on coming back to my closet with another, uh, you know, yard sale blue gingham shirt that didn't quite fit. That I Yeah. And if it doesn't fit, to, you must the other quit. Stick. Yes. Yes. You know, I mean, what the nineties? Why were the nineties all about like giant clothes? What was that? What was going on there? That's a really good question. I mean, maybe it has something to do with the androgyny. Like, may, maybe it was a calling attention to oneself in a non. I was about to say non-ironic, but but I feel like that word's overused so much. I don't know. It 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 might be a kind of there was a kind of humility in the nineties. You know, like on that. Yeah. You know, like, like, I don't want to, like, I'm imperfect. Mm. And I don't want to front like I am perfect by wearing perfectly fitting clothes. Ah, that's, that's really sweet. Because yeah, it was an era where, I mean, even musically, where like, you could make mistakes on major recordings or have it be raw and like, pretty, pretty rough around the edges. And that was seen as cool. So, I mean, it was one of the most human times in, in music in a lot of ways. Now there was, yeah. you know, I do feel like there on the other side of that beautiful coin, there was like maybe a uh, lyric writing got a little lazy or whatever you want to say. I mean, you can pick out like pros and cons of any era, but uh, I love yeah. the nineties. It's my favorite. Uh, it's my favorite era. And um, it's interesting now how like music has you know, as a whole, if we're swooping with a wide brush, music has become so perfect, you know, everything's so yeah. polished just because of the tech and uh, you can make a perfectly sounding like high production album on your little laptop now. Do yeah, you and see it switching back around? Totally. And, and that's interesting too, because that might have to do with attention spans being so low that you now, instead of trying to like come smush your perfect sound into three minutes it's kind of i mean i'm kind of making this up as i say it but it's kind of like you're smushing your perfect sound into 30 seconds because that's kind of all you've got yeah you know whereas the that sloppiness of the 90s i think that might have had to do with cds because since that was the 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 medium of the time because you can get, I don't know, what is it? 94 minutes. Like it's insane what you can put on. One. Yeah. Yeah. But then for value for money, you felt like you were kind of supposed to, and right. that's a long way away from, from the most sound you can get with good low end onto vinyl, which is what I don't quote me. What's like 22 minutes, yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah. If you want it to be really, really. Yeah. Fun. 
So interesting you say that yeah. because that you did hear that a lot. Like, oh, this song, this CD has like three great tracks and then a bunch of filler tracks. And um, check this out. Uh, um, I might, maybe this is inside information I'm not supposed to say to the public, yeah. but uh, my buddy Johnny P was on tour with uh, opening for the Wallflowers and he was hanging out with Jacob Dylan backstage, real sweet guy, like yeah. really like championed their band and like took them under their wing. And, uh, but Jacob Dylan goes to my buddy Johnny P. He's like, yeah, man, um, I think it's really important to have like a, a, a few really shitty tracks on every album because you, you need them to set up the hits, you know? You want your hits to look more powerful. And, uh, right. Who well, knows if he was serious, but... Points for the gonzo thinking. Mm-hmm. Not, 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 sure I, not sure I could sign up with that one because you just never know. Right, I mean, you're just trying to cast a spell, right? And the moment it breaks yeah. is, not, is not good. It's just not good. Don't, don't yeah. Break. I love, I love like, (laughs) I love, um, you know, uh, big name fellas like that, like putting down their guard, you know, it's, uh, it's really sweet and, uh, human. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so what is gonzo? Is that a gonzo rock? Is that a genre we can participate in? Is that just like going free form free ball in it? I think that's a Hunter Thompson term. Yeah. So he, I think he called himself, if I'm not mistaken, he called himself a, a gonzo journalist. Yeah, um, I remember that. And I think I just meant, yeah, I just think I just meant outsider. Okay, yeah, I like that. I, I recently just watched, uh, what's the Johnny Depp movie, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I tried to watch it when I was younger. It didn't make any sense. And then, uh, yeah, all of a sudden it, it, it made a lot of sense, you know? Yeah, he's an entertaining character for sure. I mean, that's the kind of person that, you would really love to know, but not be in a band with, you know, it's like what people say about a place, like nice place to visit. I wouldn't want to live there. Right. I feel that way about some intense characters, like awesome to talk to. Don't necessarily want to be in a full-time functioning uh, situation with you. (laughs) You Yeah, totally, man. And there's, there's something to that. Like, uh, it's sim. It's a little bit similar to like you. You don't want to be roommates with your best friend. You know that's so mm. such a risk. I mean, I learned that one the hard right. way. Where uh, right. my best friend in the world and I were roommates. I was like so excited. It was going to be like the best musical creative year. We were in a band together. Yeah. And then I had my relationship fall apart, and the lady that I split with he started dating her best friend who oh. uh, hated me, you know, and I was 21. I didn't know how to handle right. it. So it was just this year living in a small room together, total discomfort. Uh, it was, it was right. the saddest year of my life to, uh, to lose my girlfriend and my best friend all at once, you know, man, that's hard too. Yeah. And that's hard. Friendships, obviously. I mean, you can say a lot, they're so interesting, but, but so many of them, you don't, except when you're really young, you don't tend to spend as much time with them as you would with like a a romantic partner. And so in a way, friends all get to be the fun uncle. Yeah. You know, because you get to have just this shiny time, constantly shiny, even when you're just doing nothing because there isn't quite as much of it. So you're always a little fresh to each other, you know? Yeah, it's... it's... And living together is... you, You find out what the rose really is under the bloom of the rose when the bloom goes. Yeah, maybe a loose parallel to that is like you kind of always want to be the assistant coach and not the head coach because you're like, (laughs) you know, everyone's best friend and it's less pressure, you know. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know enough sports analogies. That's fantastic. Be the assistant coach. Yeah. Sport. I mean, mid. Yeah, I live in Milwaukee, so it's sport and uh, beer and football, and uh, that was always a. a little bit confusing growing up, you know, as much as I like those things, I'm a huge basketball fan. I played my whole life, but uh, yeah, being like an arty farty kid in the Midwest is it, it maybe a bit harder to navigate coming up than uh, some, some other, I don't know, coastal environments or it wasn't very sure. ar- arty farty friendly, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. Did you find yourself, um, did you have a friend who was into the same things or were you kind of like, keep, was it really your own thing? Well, that's a good question. I mean, for a while, it was just me in my parents' basement. Uh, just, you know, and I, I was having a great time. Like, um, for my 
birthday's December 27th. So I got a combo birthday yeah. uh, Christmas right. present when I was 14. And it was one of those little four track recorders. Amazing. Yeah. And that changed my life. I was, I remember totally. like the day getting it and like putting a little four note solo over like a, a couple yeah. of power chords and playing it back and just like my mind just being blown to shit totally. and yeah. I just got obsessed. And, um, so I was down there in the basement every weekend playing, recording. And, uh, you know, I think my parents were a little worried about me cause I was like uh, struggling a little bit socially. Like I didn't want to go to the park and get uh, brain damage playing recreational football, even though I did, I did that a few times, right. but it was like, right. you know, and there's the kind of social pressure of like, you should be outside with your friends and I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, but it doesn't feel right. I like making songs. So eventually my best buddy, Benny P, a great man, a great citizen. He was, uh, he was my accounting partner and I, uh, I sucked at accounting. I was like blowing it. I was getting a C minus. So he helped me in accounting. We bonded. And then he was like, yo, man, I play the cello. Um, right. and I'm, and I'm in the school orchestra. So like I saw him play, he could legitimately play. And I was like, yeah. well, dude, you should get a bass, like talk to your pops, Mr. P and like, let's try right. to get you like a crappy bass from the music store. So we worked on it for like a few months and like broke down Mr. P. He took us to the music store, bought this like pile of garbage bass that sounded good enough. And, uh, Benny P was playing bass within a day. It was, it was easy for him. And then That's we had fantastic. a band. Yeah. Yeah, man. And, um, and then, right. And, and the social pressure to go do things when you want to be in the basement making songs. And it turns out that years later, that making songs of yours is the greatest friend making machine there is in the world. Wow. The delayed gratification. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Never thought about that. It's like, yeah, the opposite of now and the, the hyperspeed and the instant gratification. Um, I think that's right. always and, and true. The, yeah, and and now you know, um, I have a I have a three year old, and um, I've been thinking lately about how sometimes qualities that end up being so uh, useful and good for a person later in life can be kind of possibly a little difficult for parents at first. And in a way, maybe your job as a parent is to protect those things and not change them because, you know, like having a strong will is useful in life. Having drive to, to, you know, the yeah. thing that you love, go, go get it. And, and when you have a kid who's really obsessed with the things that he loves in a way that's like kind of hard to ride, like kind of a, a bucking Bronco of desire, you know? Um, yeah. But it's going to end up being so great. So anyway, yeah. So just, yeah. Were, were, did you have anything like that as a kid where your maybe your folks were like, maybe you were doing something outside of the box and they were like, uh, maybe he should be doing something else or how did, how did that look? No, well, not so much. I mean, at first we were, my sister and I were what's called like lat latchkey children, yeah. meaning that our parents were just never around uh, or not a lot. They, they went to a lot of, um, they went to a lot of parties Um and actually one of my favorite, this is a side note, but one of my favorite memories is that um, my dad in an era when, at an age when now you would absolutely have to have a babysitter or be considered negligent yeah. parenting. <laughs> uh, it wasn't at the time, different time. And they would just leave us alone very young. And I remember when I was maybe, oh, I don't know, four and my sister was seven or something. Um, my parents went out to a party and my dad left a tape recorder we shared a room. We had two single beds next to each other. Yeah. And uh, the little um, table in between our beds, he had a tape recorder there and a piece of paper. And the piece of paper said, um, uh, number one, take these cookies, two cookies. Number two, press play. Number three, get in bed. And there was this great story. Like he'd recorded a bedtime wow. story. Wow. That brings a tear to my eye, Matt Cause. That's so yeah, sweet. Man. So sweet. Wow. It's so sweet. Yeah. So nice. Um, but so, yeah, and so I did, when I really got into music, like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, my, my parents were supportive, but they were very, like, eye on the ball of, like, um, get a real job. And that's because 
I think it's because of health insurance, which is like an American condition. Yeah. That, that you, you know, you're, you're going to be dissuaded from the arts because it's not a good health insurance path. Right. Um, and so my parents were begrudgingly supportive of what I did until I got in the position to get health insurance. And then it was like green lights all over, like wonderful, go for it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because you're a little person, you have no concept of insurance. It sounds made up. It sounds like a mythical thing. Right. It's like, right. and then you, you know, you like break a leg, jumping into a swimming pool and uh, you're wiped out. You got no dough and you're that, then all the problems compile. It's terrible. I'm in, I'm in, you know, I, I'm in England right now. And uh, while the NHS can be, you know, through friends experiences, I've seen that when, if you have a serious condition, it's not the quickest, there are long waiting lists, you know? Um, yeah. But for just prevention and, and checkups and good health, it's just miraculous. It's free. I call in the morning, get an appointment the same day. And no it's just, way. yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, I mean, it does feel like that's the way it should be for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember I lived in uh, Vietnam for, for two years and uh, it wasn't the same deal, but mm. I was, you could go to the hospital for like $5 or um, oh, a hundred, a right. hundred thousand Vietnam dong. So uh, I like to say I was a millionaire when I lived in Vietnam. Right. It was, um, it was uh, 48, a million Vietnam dong was $48. But uh, I, I don't, I can't remember if I told the story on the pod before, but real quick, like, um, I had this cyst in my leg and my buddy, sweet Chucky B, he's like, Oh, that's just a B9 cyst B ret. And uh, I went to metal, medical school for a year and a half. So I'll just, I can cut that out for you. No problem. So he puts my leg in his sink in Vietnam and he ices it down to try to numb it. And I'm like biting on a rag and he's like, Dude. Okay, B ret, <laughs> let me just sterilize this razor blade. So he sterilizes the razor blade. He starts cutting into my leg and I'm like, ah! and, uh, and I'm like, did you get it? Did you get it? He's like, B-Ret, the cyst is too big. We have to go to the hospital. So he wraps up my leg. He puts me on his little motor scooter. And we're driving through the streets of Saigon. There's like dust getting up on my legs. It's like the, the, the air is like full of chicken right. sweat and fish sauce. And uh, we're swerving we're, right, around right. motorbikes. And there's like a family of four on a single motorbike holding like five chickens and a, and a window. And um, so we finally get to the hospital and the line is like around the block, just packed. And this is not a nice hospital. Like it is, yeah, uh, right. it sure, is like sure. the, the bare bones situation. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so sweet Chucky B um, he tips the, uh, the hostess like a fiver. Like he doubles down, gives her another 100,000 Vietnam dong. We get to skip the line. We go into this back room with like a light bulb hanging from a string. And uh, this guy in like jeans and like a white t-shirt, like stained with like basically like Dorito dust. He comes <laughs> out and he's like, hello. I doctor and he speaks that's all the English he speaks so right right I'm like oh no and sweet Chucky B's like I trust this guy he, he yeah yeah he knows what he's doing <laughs> yeah he's legit you know he, yeah. he had just finished a large fry from Arby's and I'm laying on the table and uh yeah he, he no uh wrapper around the table just like <laughs> hopefully they sterilized it but I doubt it and uh he starts going at my leg and uh and before you know it, boom, he stitched it up in like 12 seconds. He's like, okay, finished. So this guy was the master. I was fine. And then sweet Chucky B had like a couple like cysts in his head. So he's like, hey, man, can you cut these cysts out of my head? While so we're here. The guy yeah, takes out the cyst out of his top of his skull in like a minute. And uh, boom, it was the best $9 we ever spent. You went to the wizard. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah this guy was, yeah, he was, he was probably he's the Michael Jordan of uh, Vietnamese right. medicine. <laughs> yeah have you, oh, man, you know what i want to say i i i i loved your mentioning the four track because it reminds me well i just love thinking back to how magical those machines seemed at the time and i borrowed a friend's when i was 16 and i recorded uh billy bragg's a new england Do you know that song? oh i love that song yeah 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 and uh and i played the guitar twice and i sang it twice and put those tracks 
panned left and right. And to this day, I haven't gotten over that sound, like double tracking. Yeah. It's the, the magic of it, you know, like it's impossible. There are not two of you. You cannot have your voice twice. Right. You know? So it's like, it's fictional or something. Yeah, you can somehow employ a former version of yourself to be right. in your band. Exactly. You stick around. Me yeah. from five minutes ago. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's And I think Elliot Smith in, in Modern Times kind of made that famous, didn't he? For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Because I remember like it was like it, it always felt like there was like a bonus ghost kind of like whispering in your left ear. I was like, I want to be able to do that, but I don't yeah. know how. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, how about this? Back to back to like the parenting world you know you talk about your folks kind of giving you total freedom and letting you roam is your um how are you with your with your own kids i think you have two kids two yeah i have a teenager and a toddler okay sweet 16 and three is it because i feel like i would be a helicopter parent i'd be like oh you know don't don't pick up the guitar the string's gonna break and poke your eye out like don't fall off the couch how how do you not do that right i i I mean i don't know i've heard a friend of mine, Charles uh, Bissell from the Wrens, said something like, um, something like bedtime as a parent is when you go over the hundred things you would have done differently that day or something, some, something like that. You oh, know, okay. just that it's, the, it's constant heartbreak being a parent, right? Because you, you just wonder if you did the right thing. And, and it's so case by case, right? You want to give them freedom, but it's like, I really feel for every parent you see with a kid on a, on a scooter or a, or a razor or whatever, or a balance bike, you yeah. know, and they're hurtling towards that sidewalk, you know, that street with cars in it. And you want to <laughs> yeah. trust them that they're going to know what to do, but you can't help but yell out to like, okay. Ah, that, that. Yeah. yeah. Wow, man. I don't know. Yeah. Find that balance. Stress. How about in like your own world, even now or pre kids? Are are you um? Do you get much anxiety, or is that is that a battle, or not really, or do you have ways to kind of just stay zen? Oh, anxiety as a person. Oh man, yeah. Well, I think it's been a constant. Um, I do have ways now, and uh, some of them I wish I'd had when I was younger. It would have done me a lot of good, you know. Uh, I have a I, I meditate daily, and um. I've been fooling around with that on and off for, for years, but this last year I've started to really commit to doing that every day. And, you know, it really does make a difference. I don't think it's quite at the David Lynch level, you know, cause he kind of evangelizes about meditation and, mm-hmm. and, and I think it's hearts and obviously in a great place, but like, I don't think all of us are going to meet in a great oneness and all of a sudden be free of trouble. Like, no, it's, it's not going to happen. But, uh, Am I 5% less anxious than before? Yeah. And does 5% matter? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Every, every little point. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a relatively anxious person, but, but as I age, I'm becoming a lot less anxious. And I think that's a function of uh, something I didn't know about, you know, some things nobody tells you. And I, and I think as you get older, you get calmer because your body has that much more evidence that you're not in major trouble. Uh, you know, like uh, if I've made it this far, maybe there are no um, demons and monsters actually leaping at me at the moment, uh, literally or figuratively. Like I'm, right. I'm not in much danger. So maybe I can, maybe I can let my guard down. It's really you know? nice to hear you say that, that it's possible to get a lot less anxious as you age. For sure. And uh, I, yeah, because I guess when you're young and especially in your 20s and earlier, I mean, you just have so much excess energy to spend on things. It's yeah, almost d- like, right. yeah, it's almost like you're wealthy in a, in, a, in a bad way where you're just blowing your money on like extra large swimming pools and helicopters that you can't truly afford Maybe that's a, sh- a crap right. analogy, but yeah, you just, uh, it's like, well, I have the energy. I'll go out seven nights in a row or whatever. Oh, right. Sure, sure. Yeah, you've got a lot more, a lot more stamina for, for harming yourself. But I I'd heard a friend put it this way that I think is really interesting, is that your ego, when you're a toddler, is protecting you. It's telling people around you, I'm, you know, what makes you cry out, right? Like, I'm hungry, I'm cold, I'm tired. Uh, I need to go to the bathroom, whatever it is. Like you, there, there are things that you're, you're alerting the people around you to this 
trouble. But as you get older, you can, uh, and this is what my friend said that I think is so great, is that you can, you can retire your ego. Like, thank it for protecting you all this time and uh, alerting the powers that be around you <laughs> to your needs. But now you can retire. We don't need you anymore. You don't have to freak out. Like, things are taken care of. And yep. I can hear myself. I don't need to be screaming about what I need. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. You can yeah. Uh, re- retire that jersey hanging on a banner in the That's rafters. Right. And, uh, That's right. That's right. It's a wonderful you, career. You, great <laughs> career. You don't ever have to look at it again or attend the arena right. if you don't want to. So, yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool, man. And, um, you know, I will say, like, I mean, you've you've done a great job of, like, really aging gracefully. And, I, you know, your whole band included yeah, in that. Sure. Is there is, – what's, what's to that? Any uh, – anything to that um well let's see we we were a little older anyway so when our first record came out in 1996 i was 29 which i would consider that to be a good five or six years ahead of what you consider like rock and roll bands when they really kick off i think you know it's kind of especially in that era yeah yeah and also because it's not like it's not the hardest music to play, so you can kind of get up to speed. I mean, you know, obviously there's so many like 19, 20, 21 year old whizzes out there, you yeah, know? Yeah, right, right. Um, that, and then, and then I don't know, here's, here's something I've never told anybody, like aging gracefully. When I, when I was like, I started to get, the occasional gray hair when I was like 20, like 32 or 33 or something. Yeah. And my, the person who cut my hair said, Hey, I noticed a little gray hair. You want me to do anything about it? And, and I thought, no, but yeah. <laughs> like, can we not talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> just do, what, what, what did you have in mind? She's like, oh, there's something called vegetable dye. It's like not permanent, but we'll just like, just shoot a little lighter than your actual color. It'll kind of cover it up. And, and, and in a, you know, in a moment of utter vanity, but also embarrassment, I'm, that's when I repeated, like, let's, let's just not talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> let's do that. And, and, um, and I, as, and then when I hit whatever, like 45 or something, it's like, that just wasn't working anymore. And um, I have definitely a double standard uh, gender wise in that in every other way, I feel completely, uh, blank about gender like I I truly believe we're totally the same in every single way except that it's kind of weird when for some reason I think it's kind of weird when dudes like totally cover up you know I don't know why it's a double standard I I have no I can't defend it no I should be nothing wrong with it you gotta double down on it I think uh for your own like I don't know confidence mental health just like yeah plowing forward you know and i, I yeah. got a few grays coming in i'm 34 yeah. so i mean i might uh i might have a, a, a silver head in a couple of years which i don't i think it's kind of cool like, yeah, no, you know but, which is awesome and, and but yeah. the thing the thing that happened around that time is when it wasn't really working anymore i went to the dark side for four months yeah which is that i went to the dark side in the in the i called a best friend of mine um my friend saskia uh and asked her like all right, what, I, I just don't feel like going gray yet. What do, what do I do? She's like, go to my guy. And so I went and like had it done, like pro. Yeah. You know, and it turned, it made me blonder than I'd ever been in my whole life. Ah. And this guy called um, um, Christoph Ellinghaus, who runs City Slang, our German label. Yeah. He's a very honest guy. Mm-hmm. And as Germans are. Yeah, man. Un- unbelievable. And, to a fault and and i love him but 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 he was like what happened to your hair i'm like oh, I don't know. you know and he he kind of called called it out yeah and that moment finally thank god something in me was like i'm doing something i don't feel good about that's bad for me right you know what i mean yeah. to, to to betray or to try to run away from my own sense of whatever you know and so and so then i was very very happy to be free of that it just cured me that embarrassment cured me immediately and then, and right. then I just let it all go. And of, and of course it's, it's rad. And of course you should just be, be who you are, but, but we're, we're really human. Huh? Yeah. And you know, <laughs> you know, to anyone out there 
on the fence about a decision, you know, if you want the truth, call a German person and they're going to be like, yes, oh, it's, it's very shit. Yeah. Or, no, the half, second half is very good. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. And they'll tell you, they'll tell you how it is. But uh, yeah, man, I, I am, uh, I'm pumped to, to have a silver head. I don't, maybe part, yeah. part of that has to do with awesome. you. I do, I do have deep anxieties about losing my hair. Like that That's is like thing, yeah. it's a nightmare. I've had a lot of times and like, mm-hmm. you know, I, hopefully I'll be okay. My grandpa, had a good head of hair or whatever my pops or whatever but uh you know it's yeah it's a fear and it's just um it happens to so many people it's so unfair you know for for fellas you know in their 20s and 30s and uh yeah but my buddy uh scotto you know he lost his hair really young and he's like dude i freaked out about it for about six months then i bicked that shit and uh i've never felt yeah. better and he looks badass with the with the shaved head you know he looks like he looks yeah. friendly and also simultaneously a guy you wouldn't want to mess with which is a nice yeah yeah, blend, yeah you know yeah it's it's amazing that like getting over anything small or large feels so good and every time there's something you're that makes you feel awkward or it's embarrassing it is such a it's an opportunity to get over it and to feel great. Like I, the most recent thing that happened to me is very, very bizarre is that I'm very absent-minded and um, I was vacuuming the house and I had these, uh, I have these noise canceling headphones, you know, and I had these on and um, I was filling a tub with a little bit of bleach and some water to fill it up to clean it, you know, and um, like a 100% idiot i continued uh vacuuming being sure that i would remember a minute later to come back and i didn't yeah. and all the smoke alarms in the house went off sure and uh because because thankfully they're wired in such a way that that flood will make them go off yeah. and there was water going down into the kitchen and our toddler was terrified of the noise and it was a bad 100 percent bad situation now what i had not learned and anybody listening uh if you don't know how to turn off your smoke alarm it's probably something you should figure out and ours has a big red button uh some of them are red and some of them are just white like the rest of the smoke alarm but you have to press it for hold it for 30 seconds be patient and it will shut off i didn't know this and here i am panicking that these smoke alarms are bothering our toddler so i want to turn them off i also want to be mopping of course, I stopped the water first. Why would, why would but, they set but, it up that way where you hold it for 30 seconds while you're getting blasted by the worst right. sonic noise you've ever Right, right, right. It should, right, exactly. It should be five seconds. I don't know why it's 30. Um, but so I didn't know even that. So I spent a couple of minutes with one of them trying to like open it up to, to pull the battery out. So what happened? Well, nothing changed. Our insurance didn't go up. The house wasn't damaged. Everything's fine. Everything works. But my previously very mild case of tinnitus has now turned into a moderate case of tinnitus because of that accident. So I had two days of feeling wildly dumb and kind of having chills and thinking like I've screwed something up for myself. Uh, like, like, an, like an error, like an, you know, baseball error, like unforced error. Yep. And, and then now I hear it, but it's not the first thing I hear. And, It's just so perverse, but I'm not saying I'm glad it happened, but I'm happier than I was two weeks ago before it happened. I don't know why, because because it was another thing I had to get over. Oh, I relate to that. And just be okay with it. So I've had more of this getting over and 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 being happy anyway. And so it's just isn't that perverse, right? That like a bad thing has made me. No, that that makes sense. I've had lots of phobias all all through my life, and like it's like whack a mole. I conquer one, yeah. and then a new one pops up. And um, you know, I think the good news on this specific note with tinnitus, like it was only two weeks ago, you're, that's going to go away. I I got uh, we had a loud show in Minneapolis a couple years ago, in like a weird circus mm. tent. The sound was terrible. Right. And uh, yeah, my right ear was just ringing, and I I was panicking so so hard like I just yeah. doubled down on the fear and the phobia of, of like the permanent damage and you know the stress just especially with tonight it's like and with anything it just compounds the physical ailment you're feeling like bam 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 yeah, for sure. you know your for ear sure. is more clogged it rings more and then you get past it and you like someone convinces you you're going to be fine and then 
you're fine. It's crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. And even if it's still there, like you don't have to listen to it and the panic makes you listen. Do you know those? Um, have you ever been on a, on a virtual roller coaster? Yeah. Yeah. Those were big in the, in the early computer games. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I went to one with Daniel, our bass player and his little brother. We took, he, his little brother was like eight and we took him to this, um, amusement park in Madrid and one of the rides was like a Disney ride that was indoors where you just sat on this part of a it was like one roller coaster car so like maybe six people could sit in it and then you would watch the the movie that shows yeah. the the train going through a gold mine or something you know and and the thing vibrates and I I noticed something about it which is so obvious I just hadn't realized like part of the the trick of this thing is that the fear you know, or the, the imagined fear of what's happening to this uh, gold mine uh, train cart makes you hold on to it tighter. Sure. And the tighter you hold on to it, the more you feel the vibrations, which scares you more and you hold on yeah. even tighter. So, so it's all about how much you're holding it. And then I, I loosened my grip a little bit. I was like, oh, this thing's like not really doing much. And I yeah. felt like it's such a, that's such a common thing right you know like if you hold on to your pain hard or you hold on to your anger it's just going to burn you more yeah so. man wow that's just so true and uh i wish i would have had some sort of concept for that sooner because i feel like i'm only starting to figure that out in the last couple of years maybe right. you know right. it's like oh this person did me wrong or they haven't been a good friend and it's like yeah all you can do is is let that go and then it you know it, it comes back around and everything's okay and you only yeah. have so much energy to burn up on stuff and um right i've had a i've had a couple like what i would say pretty close friends just over the last 15 years and i can think of like two or three that like really like double down on like the world's out to get me vibe like the victimhood mm -hmm. vibe and then all, it was always like uh, this person screwing me i'm th this right. they did me wrong and uh, sure. you want to help them and, and kind of like, cause you're close to them. You're like the only one kind of who can give them that information of like, Hey, it's, it's okay. But you know, it's the, that's something that you can't fix. You know, they got to go through the, the right. pain on their own. Yeah. Kind of right. Cause if they can't see their own thoughts, then they might not believe you when you point them out, you know, like, like the like kind of what you're saying like the the world is out to get me thing i've been thinking about that lately because just also as i get older i i i see my thoughts more and and while I, i'm very happy to say i hardly ever blame anybody else for anything and i hardly ever like blame the world or whatever i do notice that every time something unhappy making or uncomfortable comes up that thought Thankfully, it burns out in about a second, but it yeah. does come up where I'm like, whose yeah. fault is this? Who's not me? Yeah, you yeah, know? Oh, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I agree. Yeah, um, that's yeah. that's so true. And like I've had in my life, I've had like total blind spots and stretches of like incredibly low self-awareness. And I feel like um, fortunately, I've, I've always had like a few good people around me to call me out on on bullshit, you know, which is very fortunate. So, you know, so you don't like just keep going with them. Um, with those kind of, kinds of thoughts. That's valuable. Those yeah, man. Um, what's kind of, what's kind of like getting you pumped up about, about the future? Um, so I just bought an electronic piano that's behind me because uh, I just started taking piano lessons this week and I'm so excited. I took a few lessons when I was five. I must have whined about it and my parents must have let me off the hook and for now all these years since at least since i was like 20 or something i've been saying like man i wish i'd i wish i'd continue with those pian i wish i played piano and anyway now i've like i'm gonna i'm gonna try and learn so i'm very pumped about that um, good on you i can't play a single thing on piano i can't either but yeah. you, you you could if you if you wanted to if the idea yeah. got you pumped you, you i could. wish i wish i felt pumped to like learn a new instrument or learn a new language um actually i just i went to mexico city last week and now i'm like that's what i needed to get pumped to learn spanish because that right. that city blew my mind i had no idea it was there and it's right. just like this unbelievable magical 
place of this pop culture blend of Western culture and Latin culture. Like, I mean, I know you've been there a ton. Um, I've only been there. I've only been to Mexico City once, but I loved it. Yeah. Okay. Because they love yeah. rock and roll. Down. I didn't realize like how we walk every bar we walked into. They were like playing the Strokes or like right. <laughs> playing like this alternative guitar rock. I'm like, this is like my home. This is like my world. And um, yeah, because it, it, it was. It's not like. You know, in the States, you know, you got to love the States. The ceiling's infinite. There's, it's incredible, the land of innovation. But I feel like nine times out of 10, you walk into a public place, you walk into a Walgreens, a Target, on the loudspeaker, you're going to hear, put your hands in the air like you just don't care, or whatever, some kind of like yeah, corn yeah. syrup uh, music just pumping in, into your brain. And uh, in Mexico, it's like this cultural audio explosion of like all really authentic music you could tell a lot of it's like really old and like you know probably from a hundred years ago so it, it was a very inspiring trip that's awesome and I, I know what you mean like we have that experience in a lot of places in europe spain in particular like the rock and roll culture there is is amazing there's a neighborhood in madrid called malasaña and it's full of these bars that stay open till that just stay open, you know, the, yeah. till the morning. And, and yeah, it's like flaming groovies and, and, uh, you know, or, or, or Simon and Garfunkel or, or, wow. you know, just, just like real fandom for songs and, and some obscure things and some current things here or strokes or whatever, you know, yeah. but it's, it's, it's right. It's kind of eye opening, right. To, to like, like places where the sort of American homogeny, of like top 20 of all the, I mean, that's the problem with being a huge country, right? Cause then if you're, if you're looking at things that are common to everybody, it's that lowest common denominator. We'll start to, I don't want to judge, but dumb yeah, down right. that, you know. yeah, totally. And you saying that about Spain, I mean, I've, I've never played in Spain, but it's like, I'm going at this point. That's all I needed oh, to hear. It, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Like, yeah. There are certain places in the world where, you know, you kind of musically, you, you you know, you don't know they exist and then you kind of stumble upon them or someone tells you about them and you're, you're like, wow, it's like way easier to play here than a lot of other places just from that like baseline love for this type of sonic music, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, Mexico yeah, City, yeah. Spain. And it's cool that you, you know, your band Nataserf has been like so swept up into the pop culture in, in Europe. So that's like, from what I can tell, kind of like your second home, you know, you're hanging out in France, playing a bunch, Spain, yeah. Germany, like all my, all the label guys I've ever worked with in Germany and Austria and Switzerland love you guys. I'm like, you guys know not a surf. They're like, Oh yes, my favorite, one of my favorite bands. So and they're awesome. all named Sebastian shout out to Sebastian. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah, no, we were so, we we're so lucky that way. Um, I got, I got the vac the vaccine here and the person who, they give you a little interview first with name Sharon. And then the woman who gave me the, the shot was Sharon too. So everyone's Sharon here and everyone's Sebastian there. Yeah. I love that name, Sebastian. And um, yeah, our, our label guy in Germany, um, he looks exactly like Garfunkel. So we call him uh, Garfunkel. Oh, and, uh, he's a magical guy. And um, he dropped me last year. What the hell Garfunkel? <laughs> so um Butterfingers. Yeah, yeah. Butterfingers Garfunkel. I'm coming for you. I'm turning, I'm turning my amp up to 12 yeah. next time I see you in Hamburg. Oh, you know, the, the first time we went to France um, for the band, uh, the, the label guy picked us up at the... No, no, he didn't pick us up. Sorry. We're in the taxi and we had these printouts of what was going to happen. And, and, and the name of our label guy was Le Belgi, which is, uh, you know, the, the kind person i guess um <laughs> but le belgi it's it's label guy is, no if you read it. yeah so our label guy was a label guy and it, we had a very you know, kind of jet lag moment of confusion like the label guy's <laughs> name is la, 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 is that his name no label label guy is that what he no you know and that's it's destiny crazy. is what that is matthew cause yeah 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 he had wow. to beautiful Man, this has been great. This is one of the easiest podcasts I've ever done. I feel like I've known you for a bunch of decades, you know? Right on, man. Really oh. fun. Um, any projects you want to uh, you want to maybe punt? Uh, so, let's see. So, I'm working on a... I'm writing now. So, writing the surf record. Um, there's a record that 
has been almost made for so so long that we are committed to finishing which is me and uh and um michael lerner from telekinesis nice. uh, made an album together and we got one song to go so we are absolutely going to do that um yeah and then yeah those two I love the records you have behind you. I see everyone knows this is nowhere, and I see Taz Jan. Taz, Taz Jan's Taz Jan. a good man. I talked to Taz Jan last last month. Really sweet dude. Yeah, you can see that from oh, here. Yeah. I just uh, yeah, my buddy uh, Young Scotto gave me this Jim Croce record. Who I never listened to oh, Croce. Yeah. I'm super into it. It's it's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah brother. And what, what's the top? Who's above Neil Young there? Who's that? Uh, that's a drawing I made. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I've been yeah. doing a lot of drawing. I got, a, I got like 20 of them in my house. I'm trying to, but uh, they're these really like uh, what I just found out, they're like these toxic paint markers. So I'm like killing like 20, oh, like, man, really? 800 <laughs> brain cells every time I wow. do a, uh, every time I do one. So I got a, I got like a gas mask now and I'm like putting that on um, most, most days. Yeah. Yeah. Health first. All right, Matthew, because, hey, man, we've been riffing for a while. I know you got some some missions out there in the UK, so I'll, I'll let you run. But, dude, this has been so fun. I really appreciate you coming on. You, you know, you've been a massive musical influence in, in my world. So it's uh, it's really sweet to talk to you. Thanks, man. Really enjoyed it, Brett. Really enjoyed yeah, it.